Okay, thank you for coming. The first significant encounter between Western music and architecture is one that we can date rather precisely. Um, on March the 25th, 1436, Pope Eugene IV consecrated the dome that Filippo Brunelleschi had designed for Florence Cathedral, and as part of the ceremony, there was a newly composed motet, Nuper Zarum Flores, by the leading Flemish composer, Guillaume Dufay. Though it's not 100% proven, there's good reason to suppose that Dufay consciously based the structure of his work, especially the four parts in a ratio of six to four to three to two, on the proportions of Brunelleschi's dome and the relationship of that dome's dimensions to the rest of the cathedral. After that, the relationship between composing and architecture seems to go into decline for about 500 years. Though many of you will be familiar with the comment ascribed to Goethe that architecture is frozen music. Actually, Goethe himself ascribes this um, comment to a noble philosopher, um, unnamed but probably Schelling or perhaps Novalis. Um, and the actual term, without being too etymological about these things, the actual term that Goethe used is Erstarter Musik, which means frozen, not in the sense of the ice man, but in the, more in the sense of the petric petrification. If, if, some, someone does, um, if someone does something unpleasant and you freeze, then that's Erstarter. Um, and that's, that's the actual term that, was used, that Goethe used. And indeed, the term, the term Versteinerte Musik, music turned to stone, as applied to architecture, is one that enjoys plenty of currency among the early German romantics. But you see, in a way, if we place this at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th maybe, this suggests to me a rather reactionary, old school, formalist view of music, which is probably true of Goethe, I must say, that's at odds with the much more dynamic tendencies that are evident in Beethoven's work at the time, scarcely transferable across to, to architecture. And later in the 19th century, um, the philosopher Schopenhauer simply dismissed, dismissed the whole frozen music business as, as what he said, described as a cheeky joke. Nevertheless, when Ferruccio Busoni, the Italian composer, published a two-piano version of his massive Fantasia Contrapuntistica in 1922, he put on the cover a drawing of the Western instrument entrance to the Papal Palace at Avignon. Um, this actually almost takes us back to Defy, because the, court at, the Papal Court at Avignon was actually the home base for the French or Flemish avant-garde composers just a generation before Dufay, who I very much doubt whether Busoni was aware of this. So now, we jump to the middle of the 20th century and to the spectacular alliance between architecture and music that occurs in the work of the Greek-born composer Yannikos Kanakis, which will be the main focus of this talk. First chance to see if the images are working. Yeah. Three versions. Um, I'll explain the Well, You can see you can from the third, I think you can deduce why the first two have him looking to the left, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, looking back, we like to think of a lie, this sort of alliance between music and art, architecture as something almost premeditated, as something that had to happen. But in this case, I'll suggest, we're looking at actually an extraordinary set of coincidences. Though Xenakis had been bowled over um, by Beethoven's fifth at the tender age of six, and later had responded almost equally favorably to the Rite of Spring. Um, he didn't train as a musician, but as an engineer at the Athens Polytechnic. He certainly had dreams of being a composer, but not much more than that. During and after the Second World War, Xenakis was involved in the Greek resistance, fighting against the Greek colonels, and indeed against the British. He was severely wounded, losing his sight in one eye, which explains something there. And, but in 1947, managed to escape eventually to Paris via Italy. In absentia, he was condemned to death, and that sentence remained in place for many decades. That he got his first job, basically his only office job ever, 
um, with the celebrated and controversial architect Le Corbusier was certainly purely a matter of chance. Xenakis was in Paris with no money, he needed employment, he had a Greek friend who knew the architect George Candidis, who had also studied at the Athens Polytechnic about a decade before Xenakis, and between them, they got, they got well, Xenakis a job as an engineer at the builder's studio that Le Corbusier had established in conjunction with his Marseille housing product, project. I should emphasize here, this is important, that Xenakis had never heard of Le Corbusier and really didn't know or care much about archaea modern architecture or indeed any other architecture much since the Parthenon. Um, his view basically was everything else was a feeble regurgitation of, of that. And that reflected a broad outlook of his, name, namely that the only interesting parts of Western culture basically were the very beginning in Greek antiquity and perhaps the present day. He made an exception for a few mathematicians like the 18th century um, Leopold Euler or the 19th century Augustin Cauchy, but that was about it. As for Corbusier himself, he was establishing an international reputation and was completing work on Le Modulo, the theoretical underlay of his work, which was published a few years later. Um, let me just show you here a picture of Xenakis with Le Corbusier during that early period and the cover of the Modulo, which as many of you will be aware, is based on the operation part with um, proportions, proportions which are not quite literally the Fibonacci series, but are very close to it. It's a geometric series operating in the same sort of way, a so-called red series and a blue series. Um, now, in, in, in Athens, Xenakis had actually written his thesis at the Athens Polytechnic on reinforced concrete. And many of the initial calculations he made for Le Corbusier had to do with its use. But there were other more routine sides of his work, for example, such as devising ventilation systems. And um, bit by bit, he was entrusted with actual architectural design. And when he finally asked in 1954 to have an entire project entrusted to him, the Corbusier immediately gave him the convent project of La Tourette. This was a slightly ironic cho choice, given Xenakis' implacable atheism, and the Pilocobo Corbusier enjoyed referring jokingly to Xenakis' convent. <laughs> it was at this time that Xenakis began work on what he was to regard as his first real composition, the orchestral work Metastasis. I should point out here one perhaps big difference between compositional and architectural projects. Composers work at different speeds, and if you have a day job, as Xenakis did, then you have that much less time for composing. Even so, you would normally expect to dispatch a fairly short orchestral work, however novel, within a year. And indeed, that was the case with metastasis. A building, however, can't really be regarded as finished until it's actually been built, or virtually built. Um, that takes years. By the time the La Tourette convent was completed, in 1960, Xenakis had broken with Corbusier and his music had moved off in completely different directions. However, to come back to that early phase, in the Modulo, the book of the Modulo, Corbusier writes of the architect's activity in terms of, among other things, planes, masses, and ruled surfaces. And all of these have a role to play in metastasis. In fact, in this and many other subsequent pieces, Xenakis would initially compose the piece on graph paper and then transcribe it onto musical staves. Many of these sketches for metastasis look strikingly similar to his architectural designs, though perhaps more so to those for the, for the Phillips Pavilion, which I'll come on to shortly, than to actually the La Tourette Convent. Here are a couple of examples of these sketches. Again, yeah, this is the, um, as you can see, the actual way that the sandy fold over involves exactly the same kind of model of you know, stress, stress, stress wires being twisted around uh, an axis in two directions um, that forms the basis of the architecture. And here's another one. 
looks like it's leading in a way in the sense that um, it's it actually the, the actual sum of the result of this is much more elongated than that might suggest. Um, and what I'd like to do now is play you um, play an example. The, um, what, what in architectural terms would be wires forming the basis of reinforced concrete constructions. Here, Bacar simply transcribes string glissandi. Um, and so, Sinarchus's work in, these, in the 50s it becomes notorious among other things for its very complex and completely novel use of glissandi of one sort or another. The example I'll play you here actually picks up just before the previous sketch. Um, you'll do, 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 after about 15 seconds, after about 10 seconds, you'll actually hear the, the previous little Cassandra diagram that I showed you, which I can't unfortunately because of the way this PowerPoint is set up, flip back to otherwise the music will go off. But what you will hear very audibly and very clearly is this one, I hope. to the Philips Pavilion designed for the Brussels World's Fair in 1958. This was long regarded by Le Corbusier um, as the work of Le Corbusier and indeed of course in the tradition of architect studios claimed by him as such. Uh, but in fact his contribution was limited to the sort of stomach-shaped interior of the building and to a really rather, ra rather odd, rather bizarre slideshow which he called a poème électronique and this was shown in conjunction with a music concrete piece of the same name by Edgar Varese. Interior apart, the entire building was actually Xenakis's work. Contrary to what I was suggesting earlier, this building was constructed quickly, not least because, like nearly all such structures for world's fairs, it was temporary. It would be demolished once the, um, once the fair was over, though actually an atomium from the same world's fair is still, as I'm told, a tourist attraction in Brussels today. So, the point is, the building didn't have to be designed to last for decades, just for a few weeks. And perhaps this enabled Xenakis to take risks that he might otherwise not have countenanced. Perhaps you get some idea of this from his design. Um, ah, have I jumped something here? Yes, I have. No, never mind. I'll, I'll jump it. Um, his design for the um, original maquette, the little model. Which was, which was which formed as a preliminary basis for the, art, for the, for the architecture itself. Um, as you can see, while this is clearly designed for a three-dimensional model, it's easy to see how this, too, if you like, read left to right, would give you the same sort of string glissandi that you find in a piece like Metastasis. And there are actually other sketches from Metastasis which are even closer, to, which, are, which have a closer relationship than the ones I showed you, to um, to the actual Phillips Pavilion design. Now, in this instance, Xenakis himself too contributed music. Let me just show you two views of how the actual pavilion finished up. Um, Xenakis too contributed music to a little two minute piece called Concrete PH, Concrete PH, where the PH, PH stands for Paraboloid Hyperbolique. Um, and that, and this, that, if you like, constitutes the, the novelty of, of, of this building. That nowadays, when one looks at these um, par parabolic hyperboloids, uh, uh, par hyperboloid parabolics, I always get this the wrong way around, um, they're sort of saddle shaped structures. And nowadays, they're, they're fairly familiar in terms of architecture. Um, but back in those days, they were absolutely 
in a victory, and there were grave doubts with with the among Shaikh Sinaxa's collaborators as well as, as whether it was going to be possible at all. But this structure then becomes sort of fundamental to the whole project. Anyway, so the, the, the he wrote a little piece called Compact Ash, where the PPPH stands for Paraboloid Hyperbolic, Hyperbolic Paraboloids. It was meant to cover the two minutes during which the audience entered the auditorium. Um, Xenakis's conversion to tape music is worth noting here, since another of the motivations underlying both metastasis and the orchestral piece that came immediately after it, Pithoprecta, was to demonstrate that contrary to, the, to all the claims that were coming out of Cologne at the time from the electronic studios, that electronic music would soon create new towns that would make conventional instrumental practice completely irrelevant, he, Xenakis, was able to, uh, to extrapolate new sonorities from conventional instruments far more astonishing than anything emanating from the electronic studios. Nevertheless, virtually all the young composers, the young avant-garde composers in Paris at that time, in the 50s, had at least a brief exposure to the music concrete studios of French radio, <laughs> headed by Pierre Schaeffer. And in 1957, the year before Complet Péage, Xenakis too had gone there to realize a slightly longer piece called Diamorphos. Diamorphos, as it were like. And while Concret Péage, with its hundreds of fragments of burning charcoal sounds, sounds these days like a prophetic sort of anticipation of granular synthesis, I'd like to play you actually an excerpt from Diamorphos, where the interlocking glissandi, once again, uh, say, um, indicate exactly the kind of transfer of those interlocking, play, interlocking lines that you saw in the, in the in these sketches before to the medium of tape music. So here's just a little of Diamorphos. You'll notice there between high and low sounds is actually something which recurs as a recurrent feature. Excuse that tautology in um, in Sinatis's work. At the time that Sinatis left Le Corbusier, or in fact, like the entire remainder of um, Le Corbusier's staff at that time was fired by Le Corbusier, Sinatis was gaining some attention as a composer, but his work was actually going through a rather austere even arid phase in which so-called stochastic structures were channeled through an early computer, the IBM 360. And even in Paris, um, he was becoming something of a marginal figure. I should just mention in passing that um, the relationship between, the close relationship between architectural design, ruled planes, etc., etc., and uh, uh, it, between that and that music is to a large degree, they're not exclusively confined to metastasis. Thereafter, already in the next orchestral piece, Pithopracta, or while, while Xenakis is still working on graph paper, as he does often throughout his career, nevertheless, what started to interest him there is a very particular application of the notion of masses, where the actual distribution of very large numbers of sounds is regulated by, um, by various aspects of probability theory. I must say, in that context, for example, these are some, some of these are very pithopracta-like. Um, anyway, 
So, in, in fact, as I said, it's, an artist, it's a bit of a marginal figure. So, in fact, he had to go back to work as a freelance engineer for architectural project, for projects. But a breakthrough, a musical breakthrough of sorts, came in 1964 with Aonta, a piece for four brass players and a pianist whose part is of simply dizzy difficulty. Um, the Xenarchist approach is, okay, the computer produces wonderful results, the fact that you need about five hands to play it is, well, that's, that's the pianist's problem. It's, a, it's an extreme extension. It's a lovely, it's a lovely story of Schoenberg um, when he wrote his violin, his violin for Germany. Um, a violinist um, came up to him and looked at him and said, that requires a violinist with six fingers. Schoenberg said, I can wait. <laughs> and uh, in fact, an artist didn't have to wait that long to find a pianist who could almost play. Aonta. Here's just a tip, just an excerpt. <laughs> Very much in the spirit of Paris 68, Xenakis's work requires a new turbulence, rarely as politically explicit as much new music of that period, but still engaging with often utopian, futuristic, and sometimes rather alarming social perspectives. From now on, on the whole, Xenakis doesn't design buildings, doesn't often design buildings, but what he does do is devise complex and spectacular fusions of music and light, usually indoors, sometimes out of doors, and these spectacles he calls polytopes or polytop. Um, the visual element <laughs> is not just some kind of light show, but usually employs labyrinths of laser, laser projections based on the same sort of statistical, stochastic procedures as his music. Let's make a quick excursion, um, technology permitting, through some of these. He first was at the Montreal, um, at Montreal in, in 1967, again at a World's Fair. While Xenakis didn't actually design the building here, he was able to construct the inner space. This used over 200 <coughs> cables with 1,200 attached light flashes. Um, they had to be, since computers weren't up quite up to, thing, up to this kind of program at that time, they were sort of soon after, he had to actually control them through a so-called command film for, for which he'd actually written a score. Here the music, though on tape, was actually instrumental music before pre-recorded ensembles of 11 players each. And though it's short, it lasts just over 66 minutes, the music has a sort of apocalyptic stridency, which is typical of Sinatra's music at that time. Here you can see the performance space, and here, I hope you can hear a little of the music. <laughs> Thank you. 
Shiraz, Persepolis in 1971, was particularly extravagant in terms of resources, with military searchlights, bonfires, and 150 children carrying torches. The music consisted of Diamo Fours, a little which I played you earlier, and a new 55-minute tape composition, but since it was an outdoor spectacle, I'll not go into it here. Then, in 1972, came the Cluny, Polytopic, Polytopic Cluny. Um, this was to take part in Cluny's, or to take place in Cluny's historic Roman baths. Um, so when it came to the technological aspects, there was no possibility of attaching anything to the walls. So Xenakis designed a metal wedge on which all the equipment could be fastened. And um, whereas in the per Persepolis Polytop, Xenakis had used a couple of lasers, here he used three, but with an incredibly complex arrangement of about 100 mirrors, producing results such as, for example, that. I'm sorry, the, the resolution on this is what is on the few surviving photographs is rather poor, but it's rather poor in the original. There's not a lot I can do about that. So how does the audience perceive a spectacle? I ideally perceive a spectacle of this kind. Basically by lying flat on the, back, on the backs on the ground. The actual space itself allowed for about 500 people at the time. It might occur to you that this sounds rather uncomfortable, but the spectacle was remarkably successful. Revived in a new version in 1973, the overall attendance was about 100,000 people. Here's part of the 20-minute tape piece composed for it. came the Mycenae Polytop, an outdoor presentation perhaps even more spectacular than the one at Persepolis, and particularly significant since now um, it happened in Greece, and it signifies that uh, finally, after about two, about three decades, Xenarchus was no longer marked for death in his own, in his own home country. But again, there's no human architecture involved here, so I'll reluctantly skip over it. Instead, I'll finish with the final Polytop, the diatop, the diatom, erected in, 19, uh, in 1978 for the inauguration of the Pompidou Centre in Paris. Here, the temporary building again is once again Xenakis's. And as you can see, in many ways it revisits the structure of the Philips Pavilion from 1958. You have the same kind of saddle <laughs> structure. Um, technologically, though, this is in a different world. Visually, there are now nearly 1,700 light flashes, four lasers, and 400 mirrors. The steering computer divides the 46-minute duration into segments of 120, not 100, into 125th of a second. I assume that probably has some connection with the speed at which is which is cinematically necessary. To give the um, to, to give a sense of continuity, visual continuity between fractured items. I think in, in the case of cinema, the minimum that does it is 24 images a second. And I, I was just I was just thinking this is very there, there is some comparable factor involved here. Anyway, the um, the actual program to uh, to execute this over a 40 minute 46 minute span, uh, which has been divided into segments of 125th of a second. Apparently, allegedly, involves 140 million commands. 
I was a little skeptical about this at, uh, at first. I'm still a little skeptical. Um, but we're uh, doing some calculations. Um, if, I, if, if I divide 46 into uh, 46 minutes into 25th of a second, I come up with, unless I've made a mistake, about 420,000 segments. And if I then project, and then if, if, for example, for a complex light show, you require about 300 commands per segment, which is not inconceivable, I'm 30 would scarcely do it, um, then you would precisely have um, 140, million, uh, 140 million commands. Whether that's actually the case is something I can't, can't speak on with total authority. I have to sometimes believe what I'm told. Um, as for the music, it consists of a 46-minute tape composition, La Légendaire, The Legend of Air, whose title is drawn from Plato, and it's widely regarded as one of Sinatra's masterpieces. It adopts a completely different approach to sound production um, in terms of electroacoustic music. Instead of constructing sounds electronically as a kind of orchestra, which is still what is standard today, Max MSP or whatever, whatever you happen to be using, um, Sinatra's method, I quote, constructs and acts directly on the pressure time curve, which, excel, which itself um, acts directly on our eardrums. In other words, rather than generating something and, see, and noting its effect on the eardrums subsequently, what actually takes the maybe ear membranes as a, start, as, as, as a starting point for the actual structuring of the composition. For whatever reason, however, in the last 23 years of his life, Xenakis wrote several electronic compositions, but none directly allied to significant architectural projects. So this final example, here's a little, here's part of the actual light spectacle that was involved, a fragment, a 25th of a second maybe. Um, so this final example has to act as a perhaps regrettably premature last will and testament to this aspect of Xenakis's prodigious output. Here again is a, is a fragment from that piece. Thank you for your attention.